Hello, thank you for joining us for a new Ask the Pet Food Pro chat. This series is brought to you by Pet Food Forum and the editors of Pet Food Industry, the magazine and digital, digital content provider with decades of providing the market with pet food expertise. You can find our content at petfoodindustry.com. Ask the Pet Food Pro is a great opportunity to connect with an industry expert and ask the questions that are most on your mind while learning information to help you and your company provide high quality pet food and pet treats. Today's chat is about the benefits of using natural colors in pet food, and it's supported by Oterra. Thank you to, very much to them. And our expert today is Ashley Martin, Senior Application Scientist for Pet Food for Oterra. Welcome, Ashley, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you for having me. Sure. Um, before we start the discussion, um, I have a few items to go over with everyone. First, you've all been muted to ensure everyone can hear and focus on the discussion. So please submit your questions or comments in the chat box. Um, some of you submitted questions beforehand, which we really appreciate. We're gonna to try to get to all of those or as many of those as we can today, along with the ones that are being submitted in, in real time. And finally, this chat is being recorded. You can access a recording starting in about a week at petfoodformevents.com and then click on the Ask the Pro tab at the top. Okay, so we're going to start with some basics about natural colors. Ashley, um, can you please tell us, like, just from a very, you know, foundational level, what are natural colors? What are they not? <laughs> and, you know, maybe perhaps give some examples. Yeah, of course. Um, so generally speaking, natural colors are manufactured um, from raw materials from nature. So if you can find it in nature and you can make a color from it, then that would be a natural color. Um, in the US, these colors are specifically listed in the Code of Federal Regulations, um, and they're called colors exempt from certification. So that's where some, some confusion comes across sometimes because the FDA does not see colors as natural. Um, they see colors that are exempt for cert from certification and colors that are certified. So the natural ones will fall under exempt from certification. Um, and some examples of these that are commonly used are annatto, turmeric, uh, black carrot, um, cochineal. So that's actually the insect um, grown in South America. And, um, but all of those sources can be found from nature. So oh. natural colors are not manufactured from chemicals and do not require FDA certification as synthetic colors would like FDNC 40, FDNC blue too. So when you see that FDNC prefix, um, that signals to you that it is a chemically derived color and it is labeled as a chemically derived color. Right, okay. Um, it sounds very complicated. <laughs> um, um, so, um, you, so you mentioned the FDA certification aspect mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. How does that mesh or does it with the APCO definition of natural? Yes, so um, the pet food industry has a little bit easier because APCO did define natural. Whereas the human food, there is no natural definition. So it's left up to, um, up to the companies to kind of define that on their own. So for AFCO, um, we can actually fit our colors very clearly within their definition. Um, being derived solely from plant, animal, or mind sources, um, either in the unprocessed state or having been subject to physical processing, um, heat processing. The, our colors are generally speaking um, processed in a very easy way, um, a way that you could kind of process in your kitchen. Um, hmm. They're very simple extractions. So they actually fit very well into the AFCO natural definition. The, the kind of the ingredients to watch out for is really some ingredients that might be used in the coloring components. So the sources themselves are natural and they fall into that definition, but some of the other ingredients used in the colors could potentially not fall into that ingredient or into that definition. So oh. you wanna just be careful that some of those subsidiary ingredients like preservative, for example, um, if it's a synthetic preservative, then it would not qualify as AFCO natural. Oh, if that makes okay. sense. Yes, that, that does make sense as much as AFCO yes. things make sense. I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> um, so what are the benefits of using um, natural colors versus um, 
artificial colors. Right. So I think the biggest benefit is just that it's from nature. Right. Um, you're not adding chemicals. You're not adding some of those other ingredients that are kind of seen as nasty ingredients or, you know, un, unclean. Um, so, and then we'd like to say at Oterra that nature got it right the first time and we just make them better and easier to use. Um, so consumers we know in human food and also in pet food are asking for natural sources. Right. You're asking for cleaner label products, um, some of those unacceptable ingredients to be removed. So I think that's really the biggest benefit. Right. Um, and then also when comparing natural colors to synthetic, we, we've done so many, so much improvement over natural colors in the last, you know, 15 years mm -hmm. that they really can be used at a level similar to synthetic. And you can really match any synthetic color you're looking to with a natural. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, well, we talked a little bit about AFCO and the FDA. Are there different regulations in the EU um, concerning natural colors versus not? Yes, so there are. So there are um, colors that would be considered food ingredients in the U EU. And then there are also colors that would be considered feed additives or sensory feed additives. Um, so you really have, if you're thinking of your fruits and vegetables, those would be considered more of an ingredient um, in the label. And then if you're looking at like annatto or carmine or something like that, then that would be the sensory feed additives. Um, so they really are very clearly labeled. Um, and it really, you just kind of need to know where to look. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So it, it really is very clearly defined in both the US and the EU. Um, it's just a matter of finding that information. So. We are experts in that. And so I, if anyone has any further questions or needs more information, you know, we have a huge regulatory team that's really there to help. Okay, that's good to know. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, carmine, is it carmine? Yeah, um, carmine or was, cochineal. Yeah, someone was asking if that's an, is that, if that's natural under a, AFCO uh, definitions. Right, so we will define it um, as natural under AFCO. Um, because of the one, the definition of carmine itself in the FDA um, is defined in a certain process. Um, and then the source is from an insect, so um, an, an animal. So we would therefore um, define it as natural. Um, and they also allow for, I'm just looking at the definition here. So they allow for other rendering, purification, extraction, hydrolysis, enzyme. Um, enzymolysis. So a lot of those processes is how we actually make our colors. So, so they still, even with the additional processing, it fits into the definition. Ah, okay. Um, well, actually, I mean, we, we talked about carmine. Uh, there are a lot, we have, we had quite a few questions come in about specific sources and, and color reads, yeah. but let's, um, we had a few other things come in before that. So this is interesting. So someone commented that natural color, you know, nature itself sometimes has natural toxins and, you know, do, do, are those screened for in creating natural colors for pet food? Correct. They are screened for. Um, we follow the EPA guidelines. So um, any, any EPA restrictions, any, um, any uh, toxins or environmental toxins or anything that could come from the earth with the color is screened for and then specifically um, filtered out or removed in, in one way or another. So yes, that is on the radar and that is clearly, clearly looked at. Okay. Um, do states vary in their natural color, um, the enforcement of natural color regulations? So you know as of? far as I know, they do not. Um, they, they should all be following the FDA, which, and I think I, I didn't quite touch on this before, but the, um, the AFCO OP is a copy paste of the FDA regulations. Okay. So they should not vary state by state um, as far as being regulated. They should all be the same. So, and that, that kind of goes with the registration. So like state by state registration is different. Sure. No, the regulations are all the same. Okay. 
that is good to know. Um, so what about how do you, the question that had come in was how can you address natural color stability in food matrices? Yes. Is that an so, issue? Um, so we have been using natural colors for, you know, 140 years with this company. Um, I've been working with natural colors for over 20 years. Um, and it really, so we've come to learn what those pigments, how they act, how they, um, how they behave, but we will actually in pet food specifically, I have tested the pigments in those matrix matrix, um, so that we can understand, you know, how does it respond to heat? How does it respond to light? How, um, how did these colors change over a two year shelf life in sure. a canned wet food? So we do all of this um, through, by putting the colors into the, into the, the food, processing mm -hmm. it as a manufacturer would process it, and then putting it into a long-term stability. Um, and we can also do accelerated testing through accelerated light testing and then accelerated heat testing. So we really have a very good idea how these pigments will perform. Um, and then we only will recommend the colors that we know will work well. Okay, that makes sense. Um, just a, a comment back to the, the question about how states, if states um, mm -hmm. enforcing differently, someone commented that some states will ask the substantiation of the natural color, just for everyone to know that. Okay. Thank you, Paul, for sharing that information. Yes. <laughs> um, so we've had several questions come in about caramel colors. Okay. Um, one that had come in per, per, uh, previously was caramel color is necessarily, necessarily used to denature an edible liquid egg to distinguish it from edible eggs per USDA guidelines. Can, so can you talk about the different grades of caramel color and what other cleaner label options may be to achieve this purpose? For sure. Um, so that was actually interesting. I don't have a lot of experience with the USDA, so that was very interesting for me to hear that, and I will actually go and look further into that. Um, but, but there are four different classes of caramel. You have, whether you're in the US or in Europe, it's either one, two, three, and four, or A, B, C, and D. Um, they all, one and A are the same, you know, they, they work like that. So um, class one is your cleanest caramel. So essentially okay. it's just a cooked sugar. Sometimes they're classified as burnt sugar, um, but it's literally just a cooked sugar. So that would be your cleanest label. The other um, class two is then modified with, um, cooked with ammonia, ammoniated. So, and then there's also further processing um, done. And that's where sometimes you hear about it with California and, and the um, carcinogens in caramels, um, whether there's ammonia or sulfites used. Um, but if you're looking for your cleanest option, that would be your class one. I'm assuming there's a cost difference between uh, the Yes, different... there's a cost difference and there's also a strength difference. Okay. So in order to get those really, we call them high strength caramels in order or double strength sometimes, um, in order to get that really high strength, they use both ammonia and sulfites in that processing. Uh -huh. um, so, so that's really your class four will be your strongest and your darkest shade. And then kind of going back to class one, which would be your lightest and uh -huh. your more of a golden shade. Okay. Um, but we're also making great strides in caramel because we we know that the industry doesn't necessarily want those class three and class four products. Um, so we're getting much better at that class one as far as getting a darker shade. And I'm assuming it might be more stable though, that if it has the, the higher levels are more stable in processing maybe? Sometimes um, in pet food, I think they're all very stable. Okay. So really where caramel becomes less stable is in other applications like beverages or something where there's a lot of water activity and a low pH. Caramels may be somewhat sensitive. Okay. Um, are they, uh, someone has asked if they're allergenic? Um, so allergenic? no. So okay. our, our colors are <clears throat> allergy free. Um, so carmine in human food is seen as a sensitizer 
So in human food, it needs to be labeled as carmine, but in pet food, it is not seen as a sensitizer. So it does not need to specifically be labeled. That was a good segue because someone just asked if, um, if there's a proper way to label natural colors, uh, do, do you need parentheticals? Yes. So you, so it, it is a bit vague in how you would label them, but um, you need to, you need to tell the consumer that there's color added. Right. So whether you would say anato for color, anato parentheses color, um, color maybe with even, anato. Maybe even the specific color that it, yes. that it gives. In yes. parts. Okay. So also, so that leads me to um, also with natural colors, you can simply say color added. So that is one thing that you'll see is that if it's a natural source um, or if it's in the, if it's classified as exempt from certification, um, then it, it does not need to be labeled specifically by its source. You mm -hmm. just need to let the consumer know that the color is in there. Um, whereas that is different from FDNC colors or synthetic colors because they must be labeled as FDNC Red 40 or Red 40 or, but they, they need to be labeled by their name. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we did one of these chats a year ago and I remember titanium di dioxide was a big part of the conversation because of uh, new regulations in the EU. Yeah. Uh, has that situation started to kind of settle and sort itself out? I mean, I think so in EU, those still that still maintains the same. Um, Canada has recently done kind of an overview of what's in the US and what's in the EU, and they have decided to not take the stance of EU. So they will will not be banning it. It will still be allowed in Canada. Um, the evidence wasn't wasn't overwhelming to have them remove it. Um, the US has made has done nothing since then, as far as a regulatory standpoint. Um, there are some bills being passed or being looked at in California, um, potentially requiring a warning label or something like that. Um, and then I'll, also on that line, um, we still are looking into things that would be potential replacements for titanium dioxide, but um, Right now, there's no, that would require a regulatory um, petition of the CFR to add a color in. Um, that's a very timely process. It takes a long time. So all I can say is that we are working on something um, and hope to have it at some point. Um, but, but we do see that as a huge gap in the pet food industry. Um, I also like to kind of lead customers to look outside of the box um, because titanium dioxide is often used in pet food, not for a white. Nobody wants white pet food. You just want it right. to look brighter, um, creamier, more uniform, something like that. So I would, I would suggest looking at other colors. You know, if you have product variation in your chicken canned wet, for example, and you add titanium dioxide, what if you could add in a turmeric or an annatto and give it, give it consistency that way instead of going into titanium? So until there's really a regulatory move and we get another white approved, um, there's not a lot of good options. Okay. And then the options that are out there right now either don't survive heat processing, um, like calcium carbonate is used, but it has its limitations. Um, they also add in extra um, nutrition ingredients. So um, I think I saw there's a new petition for tricalcium phosphate for a whitening in human food. Well, then that adds phosphates into your formula. So you need to make sure that there's a balance between the minerals you're adding for whitening and the nutrition that the animal needs. So would that be the case with calcium carbonate too? Yes. Calcium okay. carbonate again with the calcium, but right. I just know with the phosphates, it can actually be detrimental. Sure. Right. So, right. Um, so that's just something to think of. So maybe instead of trying to replace titanium, we look at, you know, adding a yellow or a, a pink or an orange to try to 
bring differentiation that way or bring consistency that way. Right. Like, as you said, think outside the box. Yeah. Um, so just to loop back on a couple of these points, um, the person who had asked about the proper way to label, mm -hmm. uh, what was, so you could, can you group multiple natural colors as, and just list them as color added? Correct. Yes, you okay. can. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then uh, specific to labeling and regulation two um, is 21 CFR 101.22 valid for pet food. That's the labeling section. Um, it is, there is a copy paste in the CFR or in um, AFCO. And I think also in the FDA, it's 501.22. If I'm thinking um, is the labeling clause. So it's a copy paste. Um, the only difference is that the carmine. So for human food, carmine or cochineal must be labeled as so. Um, and in pet food, it specifically does not need to be labeled that way. Okay. Okay. Just so you know, folks, um, Ashley and her team, her colleagues at Oterra will get all your questions from the chat box. So if mm -hmm. they can always follow with you later, if you need more specific information, um, like something like that with a, asking you to remember codes off the top of your head, which you probably know, but <laughs> it's a little <laughs> bit more. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, what else are we are coming in. Um, we have a few processing and inclusion label, but let's let's stay on the the um, the specific kinds of sources that have come in. Okay. Someone has asked about seaweed oil. Um, is that a natural food color and antioxidant too? Um, and that is a new one for me. So it is not specifically listed in the color additives. Um, so another thing about color additives is they, they should be labeled by their intended use. So if you're adding a seaweed oil for antioxidants and it's adding color, then your intended use is the antioxidant portion, and then you wouldn't label it as a color. Um, mm -hmm. If you're adding the seaweed extract to get that color, then your intended use would be a colorant. And then it's technically not allowed because it's not listed as a color additive. Does that make sense? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, it's your intended use. Um, you know, companies can kind of choose to do whatever they would like, but we, we kind of take the conservative approach at Oterra and we recommend, you know, following the regulations and very clearly and, and labeling colors when colors are added for color purposes. Yeah, someone just sub submitted a follow-up question about, you know, what would be the intended use of, of the seaweed oil? And it sounds like that's, for pet food at least, may be something that still requires some some research or um, and, and or regulatory approval. So um, another one that had come in that was, uh, I think, could do in different, but maybe not, um, have alfalfa as a natural color, specifically direct dehydrated alfalfa and not sun cured. <laughs> um, so this, in this case, it was harvested at high moisture, then processed through dehydration to preserve color and natural nutrients. Right, so I, cause I know alfalfa is used, so we don't offer an alfalfa color here, um, but if, I think that's probably a gray area because okay. it also offers a considerable amount of nutrition. So, um, that's, that's kind of a tricky one. Okay. Um, as long as you're not labeling it as a color, because again, it's not an improved color, an approved colorant, but if it's a dual effect um, and the intended use is actually nutrition and it just happens to bring some color, um, then that I think would be okay. Right. Um, in my experience, a lot of that color doesn't last. Okay. So, so you can add it in and you might have a nice green product at day one but it kind of oxidizes over time and will shift to brown. So um, it's, it's not the most stable, um, but it, it, it can be an option. That helps. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we have some more labeling questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so under AFCO or, or FDA really, 
Um, can you just make a claim something like made with natural colors or made with no artificial colors? Right. So um, you know that a, a natural claim by AFCO, you have to like follow all these guidelines if you're actually going to put a natural claim on your product. So our colors satisfy the AFCO natural definition, but that's really up for the cons really up for the customer and the, the company to decide if they can put that natural statement on there. Um, stuff, stuff that we see is um, colors from natural sources, something that's a little more, um, a little less direct. So colors okay. from natural sources, no synthetic colors, um, I've even seen no FDNC colors. Um, so something that can, is, is true. Where and, you can, and you can show, you can substantiate. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Made with natural colors is a little bit, um, it's, it's very direct. So it's, it's saying a claim. So um, colors from natural sources, things like that is, is really, I think, a, a safer, a safer claim. But in the end, it's not, there's no legal, there's no regulatory guidelines on these claims. So um, we provide guidance and then it's really up to the customer to decide what they're comfortable with. Right, right. And it probably would vary from state to state how they might enforce yes. that. Yes, probably that as well. Right. Um, someone commented back to Carmel. Uh, she was understanding that uh, Carmel color needs to be listed with with its name, twenty one CFR seventy three point eight five. Um, as far as I know, Carmel does not need to be labeled that way. But I will check on that because I guess I don't know for sure. Okay. Um, it does contain sulfites, so that would be when there was an allergen question before. Right. That would be one where there would be sulfites labeled on the on the label of the color. I don't mm -hmm. think you would need to put that onto the, the packaging. But as far as I know, the carmine and cochineal is the only um, natural color that needs to be labeled specifically with the name. But I will go back and look at that. Okay. All right. Um, and in class one, I would assume, because it's just caramel with no additives. Yeah, and so that's the that's kind of the tricky part with caramels, as they're all labeled the same. Ah. So you have your class one and your class four, and there's no way to tell the consumer that you have a cleaner label caramel versus a class four caramel. Hmm. Okay. It's okay. all caramel. Yeah. So, yeah. Whereas in Europe, actually, so I should say I'm talking about U.S., so okay. I'm specifically referencing the U.S. In Europe, actually, there are different regulations and they are all labeled separately. Hmm. So in, in, the, in Europe, you have a way of telling somebody you're using a type A caramel. It's a, with their E numbers. Their E numbers differentiate um, the different labeling of caramels. Okay. Okay. Um, so we talked, we touched a little bit on on you know stability within a food matrix and um, you know it's a, someone asked a pretty specific question you know what happens to colors when a pet food would be cooked by adding steam at 100, 150 degrees Celsius so pretty high temperatures correct so that's more in that retort process um, and it, it varies by pigment by pigment so annatto and turmeric for example are very stable to heat. So, and carmine also very stable to heat. So there, that would not affect the colors. But then if you take um, a beet color or a sweet potato color, for example, then um, that would really, you would cook the color too much and it would disappear. So it really goes pigment by pigment, but we have some very stable pigments that can withstand that heat. Okay. And I'm assuming that's true with dosage too. Um, yeah, how much you have to use it really would depend on the added on the pigment. And the Correct, additive. but something like beet, for example, which we know is not very heat stable, it doesn't matter how much you add, it it will come out colorless. Or beet kind of turns a little orange sometimes when it loses its color, but not like in a good way. So, um, 
<laughs> it doesn't really matter how much you'll add, it will all go away during cooking. Okay. But so for the ones that you mentioned that are more heat stable, um, you know, those are those are using pretty low low amounts, correct? Correct, correct. So those are some of the stronger colors. And I would say your inclusion rate would be 0.1% to 0.2%. Okay. So they could be used at lower, lower dosages, yes. Okay. And then that would mean less cost too. So correct. You're right. Um so uh, someone who, who seems new to the, the pet food community, they're actually developing a kibble for a rescue pet community, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, what are the typical colors added to kibble for either dog or cat? So we're kind of going back to some basics here of, you know, if you're, I guess it probably depends on if you're talking like you're, you're you know, quote unquote, brown and round, um, or if right. you want a little bit more uh, color added, it really would depend. Yeah, so I think when we're talking colors, um, especially when people are looking for natural colors, you're not necessarily wanting that bright yellow, bright orange. I mean, some of the kibble on the market is very intensely colored. Right. Um, I think you can get a really nice shade overview by adding, you know, a yellow and an orange and a brown where you have more of that natural mix or like a pink and a brown and a yellow. So, um, not necessarily showing that that you're no you're looking for that carrot is in there but but it mimics that you might have vegetables or other nutritious things in your product okay that makes and then sense. um black carrot also can actually be used um to obtain a nice brown shade in kibble hmm. um so so you do have some options when you're not looking for when you don't want to add caramel, you oh. can add black carrot and blends of black carrot and annatto, um, things like that to get that variation in the shade. Interesting. Interesting. And then that shade variation, this is usually a follow-up question, <laughs> typically expected by the pet parent. So we, we know dogs that they can't necessarily differentiate colors, but they can differentiate um, different intensities but I don't know if there's any studies out there saying that, you know, dogs prefer different colored kibble. It's typically the pet parent that prefers their product to look healthier, more varying, um, less right. browning round, I would say. Right. Or there, as I was mentioning uh, before we got on the, uh, went live is that I've been in, you know, other parts of the world like Asia where, you know, sometimes they prefer brighter colors, even right. in, their, in their pet foods. Um, but that brings up a good point. We had a couple of questions come in about whether color affects palatability. So, and I would say generally no. So um, the inclusion rate of the colors is very low. It doesn't affect palatability. And then the color is kind of encased in the kibble. And then you put your palatins and everything on the surface. So my general answer would be, no, it does not affect palatability. Same with wet food, I'm saying? Yes, yep, yep. Okay, okay. So um, there could be an owner misperception out there, um, you know, on, yeah. on because someone mentioned, you know, maybe that they've heard that from owners that they think certain colors affect how the, how the food tastes. Yeah, and I mean, so again, all natural colors are not created equal. So depending on your supplier, if, if somebody's had a negative experience using a color um, by a different company, I suggest you reach out to another color supplier or reach out to us because some, some products, like let's say, for example, um, cabbage, some cabbage colors have a very distinct odor while others are, have a little bit less. Mm -hmm. So, but again, I still think even adding it at that low level, even if you had a really odiferous <laughs> cabbage <laughs> color, um, it's added, at, it's added at such a low level that it really doesn't come across in pet food. Right. And I'm assuming that there ha probably has been some testing. I mean, I mean, when, when pet, when pet food companies develop a new formulation and they tend to have it, you know, right. put it through taste trials, um, and you would think that that would come up in a, in a palatability or feeding trial. 
Correct. And, and as yeah, palatability, I mean, every project, everything I've worked on, you know, it, it always is fine. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I, someone is asking if there's research out there on, on color perception among parents. I think they're uh, pet parents. Um, I think there has been, um, I remember seeing some, um, the, some, they're doing some at Kansas state, for example, with focus groups of, of owners who were trained to, you know, evaluate one. Well, I know that other companies in the industry, you know, you know, they'll, they'll recruit pet owners and train them how to talk about the odors they're smelling, the sensations that they're experiencing and in, in this pet food. So I'm assuming that's that colors would be part of that kind of research. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I know that there's been some marketing research done. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we even have some research that we've done in Europe. Um, it's, it's a little more informal, right, um, right? But there is some, I wouldn't call it, you know, research, it's more of marketing surveys and things like that. Okay. Um, where pet parents do prefer. So this kind of goes back to, we haven't really talked about humanization, but that's a really big trend right now in the industry. Sure. You know, pet parents want their pets to be eating what they're eating. Right. So if their food looks colorful, they want their pet's food to be colorful. Yeah. And um, they want it to smell better. <laughs> right. Yes. And they want it to smell better. Um, so, so they want it to be closer to what they're eating and, and adding color enables them to do that. Um, it may not necessarily help with the smell, um, but, but it, it helps with a part of that feeling closer to your pet. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, back to, we've had some more questions coming about specific color sources. Um, mm -hmm. You, you addressed beet um, briefly. You're saying that that doesn't really last at all through processing. Um, so to, to the person who submitted that question, yes, it's possible, but, you, but you'll lose all the color. But th those are, that is approved. Yes, a, it is approved. A, and in, so in kibble, um, in kibble, it can work. So again, when using natural colors, I think you have to be a little creative and look at your, production process. So for, for extrusion, for example, if you inject the beet closer to the screw, closer to the expansion point, it doesn't, it doesn't go through the whole preconditioning step. It, sure. it doesn't, go, you can eliminate some of that pre-process um, heat that would, that would destroy the color. So it's not that beet can't be used in applications. It's just one example that I was showing that, um, that maybe doesn't have the heat stability as good of heat stability as other products. Gotcha. Gotcha. But okay. yes, it is AFCO approved and FDA and all of that. Yep. Okay. What about um, molasses? So molasses is a good option, but it is not approved as a colorant. Mm. Um, so, and I'm not even sure if you'd, you can add it to your product, but I think it would provide a lot of flavor and a lot of sugar. Yeah, so that would probably be the primary, by be the primary function, right? Um, the intended right. use. So if it happens to bring some color, then that's great. But no, it is not an approved color additive. Yeah, molasses is pretty strong for humans. I'm assuming it would be, you know, even right. at low low detection rate, it would be detectable by the, by the especially a dog. Yeah. But, um, yeah. What exempt alternative would work well to replace red number three? Right. So that the best replacement would be carmine or cochineal um, to really give you that bright. It's pink. It can be very pink. Red three is almost neon. Okay. Um, so it's it's a very it's a very nice shade and very pink. Um, and then if you're talking um, retort canned. Carmine is really the only option out there right now um, to survive that heat processing. Um, we also have a, a product, um, a red sweet potato that can be used in some applications. So if it's a kibble or a baked treat or a semi-moist, then, then the red sweet potato would be a really good option. Um, but with the canned or the retort, which I think is where a lot of red three is used, um, really the best option is Carmine. Okay, okay. And is that readily available? It's come up a lot in the conversation. So I'm assuming. Yes. It's, it's, <laughs> so um, 
again, check with your color supplier <laughs> because it is, I would not say it's readily available. Um, okay. There's a lot of, there's it, it, the carmine business fluctuates quite a bit. Um, there's been a lot of people purchasing up the carmine in the industry, driving the price higher. So um, it, there, there is a shortage. Okay. Um, we have secured supply. So I think that um, it really depends on who you're working with, if okay. it's available or not. All right. Yeah, we haven't really addressed that yet, but I'm assuming, I mean, I've heard that supply chain issues within the industry are starting to ease somewhat, but I'm sure it's very situational. Um, yes. Are there are there other natural colors that are harder to get now or easier to get now or um, um, very price sensitive with, now? With everything else, so Anato is another one that goes up and down depending on supply. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing to think about or keep in mind with natural colors is they are grown naturally. They're sourced naturally. They take a year to grow. They take six months to grow. Um, so some of these colors have one crop harvest per year and that's what you get. And then the world shares that. Right. So, um, some of the products like carrots, um, turmeric, uh, even a natto now somewhat there's multiple, there's multiple, um, harvests during the year. Okay. So then there's more availability. So, um, I know that we, in the color business, you know, we ask for customer forecasts because it is so important because if you miss the harvest and then you can't, you know, you have to wait for nature to grow. Yeah. So, so it's not that it's not there. It just needs to be planned for. Right. Well, I'm assuming some of these are grown only. You mentioned that um, the carving mostly comes from South America. So I imagine some of these are only grown in, in specific places. Yes. Right. And most of them are actually grown in the regions where they grow best. Sure. Which we, makes sense. we have farms all over the world and then our extraction plants are next to those okay. so that we can get the freshest harvest um, and get the most color out of that. But yeah, but carmine is it's it has a it has a schedule. It has a harvest schedule. So, you know, they can only produce so much. And I'm assuming that some of these are also used in human food. So there's that, Correct. you know, quote unquote yes. competition. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we had another specific labeling question. Um, if something is from a GMO source, but it's been shown via PCR to be negative for genetic material, would that be considered natural by AFCO under the AFCO definition? I don't know that. I'm not sure if the um, natural definition from AFCO even considers GMOs. I don't think it does. So as far yeah. as I know, GMO wouldn't be, I, I don't know. I don't think the AFCO definition, um, it doesn't address GMO specifically, but right. potentially people could be interpreting it right. as GMO. Um, I'm not a regulatory expert at all, but yeah. I do know that the, the natural definition from, my, from AFCO has been out for quite some time. And I think right. the whole um, focus on GMOs is, is more recent. It's not new, but it's right. you know it's come up since that definition was was a uh, yeah. So someone just commented that it's not included in the natural definition. Yeah. So I believe so. because of the way it's defined as a plant source, if that plant source happens to be GMO, then then that would be included in the definition. Is how we would interpret it. Okay. Um, on that note, we do not have any GMO products colors in our range. So we specifically avoid GMO ingredients. Okay. Which is probably good in Europe because the same person commented that yes. GMO is included in the EU definition of natural is defined by PDF. So for folks on the, on the call who aren't, PDF is an umbrella organization of pet food associations in Europe. And so they, um, they don't have, they're not a regulatory body, but I'm sure they have a very powerful and, you know, uh, input and influence on on how regulations are determined there. So right, and so within our, um, so our company, our parent company is located out of Denmark. So we follow the GMO EU regulations. Okay. So our colors would satisfy that definition. Okay. Um, some more specifics. Uh, these are interesting ideas. Uh, 
there's several questions here in one. <laughs> Are tomato paste, raspberry powder, cranberry meal, or blueberry powder approved as colorants? So technically they would be because the, the natural colors those portions of the natural colors are defined by fruit juice or vegetable juice. Hmm. So if it can fall into a fruit juice or a vegetable juice, then yes, it would be an approved colorant. Okay. Awesome. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. You would think that that might resonate with pet, pet owners to see. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Again, so on that same note, sometimes those very natural sources of simply dried raspberry powder are not very stable. Okay. So you might get a really great color to start with, but definitely pay attention to the, the stability over time. Um, I like to think of it like cooking on your stove. You know, if you're making a raspberry puree or something, it might be very bright to start with, but then it kind of fades over time. Right, right. Yeah, so shelf life is a big consideration. Yes, yes. Um, since most, most traditional, at least traditionally formatted pet foods, are intended to have a long shelf life. Right, and, um, and our colors, so if the color is intended for color use, then we have, you know, we've filtered it, we've clarified it, we've, we've made it the best color it can be so that it can withstand that shelf life. Okay, okay. And I'm assuming that you and most color providers will advise customers that, you know, yeah, this will give you a good, a good color up front, but it will not, last over a year's shelf life or two years or right. whatever. Right. Right. Okay. Um, well, we don't have any more questions coming in. Is there anything else that you wanted to make sure people understand about colors, natural colors in pet food? Um, I think that just, you know, like I've mentioned a few times to be creative. So it's kind of, um, they're not necessarily cut and paste, specifically if you're looking to replace artificial colors with natural colors. There may not be a one size fits all. Um, so work with your supplier, um, reach out to me um, and, and we'll see where we can go. But it's, it's not generally as easy as just get a color, run it, it's great. Um, it does require a little bit of finesse, a little bit of additional um, thought. When putting, when putting it in your product. And possibly some testing and- Yes, and testing and testing. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, I, I'm really happy to see the industry moving towards natural. So it's, it's really a great time for natural colors in pet food. Um, so yeah, it's, it's exciting. And like I said, I've been doing this for over 19 years with just colors. So we have a lot of expertise here. That's great. That's great. Um, one last question. I think this is actually a great one to, to wrap up with. Um, uh, maybe a couple more, but what one um, was about where do we find the list of natural colors that are approved? Is that within AFCO or is that within FDA? In it's the US? both. Okay. You can find it both. So the FDA, they're listed, um, they're all listed in the food ingredient section. So the 21 CFR, um, 73 and 74, um, but it, it's all a copy paste in the OP. So okay. the AFCO will have it. I don't remember exactly where it's listed, but they have all the same information. Okay. And then in the EU, it would be? Um, I I'm not actually sure where to go to get that information, but um, I think I think if you just searched for FEDIAF, that's where it's located. Okay, yeah, FEDIAF.org. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one one last question actually to come in. Um, so we, we were talking earlier about seaweed and alfalfa and they may be used if they have another purpose that's, that they're approved for and then they you know kind of add color on the side. Are there any other examples of things like that that you know of? Of, of in substances like that? Um, so, so calcium carbonate is one that's, that's used um, and it's not approved as a whitener in pet food, but it can be used as a nutrient and then also provide whitening. Um, malt is another one. It's not provide, it's not an approved colorant in the US. It is almost everywhere else in the world, um, but it's not approved in the US, but it is a flavor. So um, depending on where, how, how, um, how much 
you need added um, that could also provide some some brown, but it is not an approved colorant. Okay. Okay. Well, this has all been great information. Um, thanks to everyone for your for your questions because I think they really helped the conversation. Thanks again to Ashley for yeah, lending you. your expertise, and thanks again to Oterra for their support. Um, to continue learning on this and many other pet food topics, uh, please watch for some more Ask a Pet Food Pro chats we have coming later in the year. Uh, also, we have a lot of webinars under our pet food industry brand. Uh, you can find those at petfoodindustry.com slash webinars. Uh, there is still time to register for Pet Food Forum, which is in a few weeks in Kansas City. Uh, we also just announced that we're going to have a conference in Bangkok called Pet Food Forum Asia in October. Um, that's in conjunction with Pet for Southeast Asia. So if anyone's in the Asian part of the world, um, you can look for that. Um, and then finally, we would really love your feedback on today's chat. So please use the QR code on the screen or watch for an email that'll have the survey link. And then finally, uh, just reminded that the recording of this chat will be available about a week on petfoodforumevents.com under the Ask the Pro tab. Thanks again for everyone for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.